Good day, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York City. Max Holland is my guest today. He is the Marina Kellen French, director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Indeed, Max is only the 10th director in the museum's 153 year history. And as of July 1st this year, he has also assumed the CEO title, unifying the roles for the first time in a number of years. A native of Vienna, Max spent time with the Guggenheim Museum, three museums in Frankfurt, Germany, and most recently was the director and CEO of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Max appears with us today thanks to the efforts of Taneo Chairwoman Ursula Burns, who is a member of the Met's Board of Trustees. Another Taneo connection is Gabby Sulzberger, who chairs Taneo's ESG practice and is also on the Met Board of Trustees. And a bit of a milestone today, Max is the 100th individual guest to appear on this program. And uh, Max, I would have loved to have sent you some sort of a plaque or something, but as you can probably tell, most of our budget goes to my uh, hair and makeup. Um, but, uh, but welcome and uh, congratulations on, on adding the CEO title. Um, so maybe actually we can just start start there. You know, uh, as you know, this this broadcast is typically geared toward business oriented um, uh, subjects. So I think people, when they think of the CEO title, they think of it in a corporate sense. So talk, talk a little bit about what that means in the um, uh, in the cultural world, and particularly at the Met, and and what what meaning what it means to reunify those titles that have traditionally been the case. Right. Well, first of all, thank you, of course, for inviting me. And it's it's an honor to talk to you and be the 100th guest of your uh, program. And yes, ha having all these different connections with Tineo and our, like our, our board is connected also to, to your work and how we kind of, uh, also, of course, impo doing important work here in New York and beyond. So it's my pleasure to be part of this program. Um, I would say that the um, clearly, uh, a museum is, of course, a different kind of entity or place than your normal um, corporation. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We are a very mission-driven institution. But nevertheless, um, this museum operates not only in a very professional way, but within a complex economical structure. Um, we have an operating budget of well, well above 300 million. Uh, we have um, over 2,000 employees. We have an endowment that's uh, around $4.5 billion. Um, and we are operating locally, nationally, and internationally in a complex environment. So all of that is to say that, uh, yes, a museum needs a director uh, to basically give the broad, so to say, programmatic guidelines develop the program, make sure that this institution follows uh, its mission and also is developing a strategic uh, outlook of how we develop as an institution. But it also in the same way needs, uh, of course, a CEO who basically is in charge of, yes, the strategic vision in the broadest context and also of basically running the place, uh, making the, the prudent, uh, I would say, economical decision. Um, and I myself, I've always been trained to, so to say, to do both. I studied simultaneously in Vienna business administration at one university and art history at the other. I always thought about a museum job of, so to say, not being a duality of things. So every programmatic decision that you take also has an economical impact to the institution. And so it, it seems to me that we've been able to do this as a dual leadership model at the Met over the last uh, five years, together with Dan Weiss, our president, and uh, until recently CEO. And then when Dan Weiss uh, decided to step down, the, the trustees of the Met kind of looked at the structure. And for the first time in decades, actually, uh, since I think now, uh, since the late 60s, uh, they decided to uh, move back towards a single leadership model, which basically brings together the director and CEO role which honestly is actually the normal setup within museum, uh, museum's infrastructure. So um, it's clearly, um, it is a role that sometimes kind of is very similar to the normal CEO role that you, you, you have. But uh, of course, given, the, given that basically at the end of the day, it's really the director that 
kind of probably matters in, in, in regard to museums and what, what they put forward to their audiences. It basically also kind of uh, shows the, that we are bringing together even more than before the programmatic side of the institution uh, with the administrative, uh, financial, economical side of this. So I mentioned at the at, at the outset in, in, in giving a little bit of your background that prior to coming to New York, you were the uh, you had the director and CEO role at, uh, at in San Francisco, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, which for those familiar with it, includes both the De Young out in the old Golden Gate Park and the Legion of Honor and Lincoln Park, two beautiful buildings. Um, but they've got about 500 employees um, and an operating budget of about 60 million dollars, something like that. And you just mentioned the the size of the uh, of, of the Met. Um, I'm wondering, you know, is that is it is it merely just a it's a it's a bigger entity, or is taking on the Met and the position that it holds in the art world culturally, just, not just in New York City, but as you say, in the nation and in the world, um, is it just an exponentially bigger responsibility than um, that you that you've now got? Well, I would say, yes, of course, the Met is bigger. The Met is actually bigger than any other muse visual arts museum in this country. Uh, and it certainly is among the two to three biggest museum institutions in the world, um, depending on what, what metric you apply. So, but I don't think it's just basically scaling it or basically saying, well, okay, this is like, half the size of the Met, and so now it's kind of a different job in that context. The Met job is different because of the, um, certainly because of the importance and the role that this institution plays within New York and with, with what New York is, but especially also within the, the, this country. Um, so different to other countries where you would have, like, let's say you take Great Britain or France or Germany, where you would have a cultural minister who basically uh, would kind of set the broader cultural guidelines for the uh, for, for for also museums in regard to restitution questions, in regard to budgetary broader questions, etc. Um, the U.S. doesn't have that. Um, so basically, we uh, as museums we kind of basically operate quite individually, and so. I would say other institutions are looking for a certain level of so to say, leadership uh, from the Met. Um, so that so actually as, a, as the Met is an institution, but you also as a Met director have a certain responsibility also for the broader field, not because you want to come, dominate anything or you want to not be collegial, but more often than not, the field as well as the media or the public is looking for the Met first to have a, a certain re response. I'm, I always use that quote from the, during our COVID time. Uh, there was kind of this <laughs> funny interview. Uh, he's a great friend uh, by Richard Armstrong, the director of the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, and he was uh, asking an interview, so when is the Guggenheim reopening during the, when, while we were closed during COVID time? And he just said, after the Met. Uh, and so basically, you, you can see with that, that basically there is a certain level of yeah, leadership that kind of is implied because of our size, because of our infrastructure, because probably also because of the overall management that we have embedded in this institution that allows us to provide even a service, I would say, to the industry. You know, you just mentioned this this notion that in other in, in a number of other countries you will have this kind of top down leadership from a minister of arts and culture or the or the like. Um, and you know, we have seen even in this country that the sort of the light touch that can come from uh, or the light financial support, let's put it that way, that could come from the National Endowment for the Arts or the National Endowment for the Humanities and the like, but wow, it can get caught up in the political cultural wars very quickly. So, I mean, um, there, there is a certain security, I suspect, that comes from state largesse to, to, to institutions that don't have to, uh, don't have to continually raise money, but I presume that the, the independence to a degree that you and other American arts institutions get to exercise is is a is a coveted um, is a coveted asset actually. I, I mean, in principle, I very much agree, of course, with you. And I have to say, I operated in both systems as a European, uh, having worked in the U.S. on and off, and having worked in Europe in, in different capacities. So basically, um, yes, if you look at the two models, and, and you you mentioned Washington as basically public funding, which basically 
I would say is within the US is, is the anomaly. So they are, uh, like the public funding is minimal compared to what's happening in Europe for cultural institutions. Yeah. But yet there's a different level of dependency, a uh, different le level of dependency on public funding and maybe also on the po political climate that you have in, in this or that particular government. Um, and so, so I'm a big fan actually of the, the American setup that's basically based on philanthropy. Um, it comes with a number of uh, those challenges that you have to manage also, especially as a CEO and director. One is you need to make sure that the, so to see the concert of philanthropy or the concert of philanthropists that you have around you is broad enough that you are not kind of almost like tethered to the singular passion of one donor. Because you will have a multitude of donors at an institution. Each one of them will be kind of very passionate sometimes about one particular thing, one particular area. And it's only by the magnitude and the diversity of the, of the different donors that you can actually then construct the future of an institution that basically really is the holistic uh, example of what, what you want to do. It's very dangerous to be in within the American system to be dependent on only one main donor or something because that I, I, then you don't have that level of independence that you have as well. And then I think you also need to uh, operate on um, on a different level of scrutiny, even like on a board level. If you take the European institution, um, the boards of European institutions are basically uh, populated by, I would say, cultural politicians. Their main job is basically to to make sure that you stay within budget, and the budget coming from the from the public hand. Um, in the US, of course, our board also looks very much uh, that we, we stay in budget. Uh, but it's, there's a different attitude about it. It's, it's more like, so what are your next ambitious plans? What is, what is your five-year strategic development for the institution? Usually the, a lot of the board members are entrepreneurs or come from an entrepreneurial uh, same, very different dynamic that's un unfolding uh, through that, which is also why you see, I would say, in the U.S., more ambitious expansion plans, more ambitious development within institutions compared to uh, institutions, especially in Europe, that are publicly funded. So talk a little bit more about the board. I, I think a lot of uh, our audience would be surprised if they were to look at the board of trustees of the, of the Met, because if you're used to looking at corporate boards, you know that they are, you know, whatever, 10 to 20 people sometimes. Um, but the sheer size, not to mention the diversity that you've just mentioned, but the board of trustees is actually a big number of people. So you do have that diversity. Um, how do you then, how do you harness that to, uh, be, so that there's not too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak? And maybe you've talked a little bit about their, their fiscal responsibilities and a fiduciary responsibility on the finances of the, of the institutional and the like. But what role does the board play in terms of, you know, of that artistic and curatorial um, mission of the uh, of the institution. Yeah. So you're right. The med sport is uh, pretty big. Uh, if you take everyone together, it's uh, around 100 members. I mean, so the trustees and the trustee emeriti of this institution. Um, and I would see that each one of them is is a member of this uh, of this board out of a genuine passion, understanding, and almost like responsibility in regard to helping and supporting the Met. Um, and I'm not seeing this just, it's not just financial support, it's really about seeing the Met as an institution that, they, that each individual is very tethered to. Um, and it basically, there's a different problem dynamic than to your regular board uh, that comes with it. There are very different reasons why people are connected uh, as a trustee. So it doesn't always mean like, you're a big collector of something, and then basically that means that's why you are you are Met trustee. Uh, we have trustees of the Met see the Met also as a great civic institution, a great and important New York institution. Some of them are great connoisseurs of of art. Others are really they have to understand that the Met as a great civic institution without a, like uh, without being so to say passionate about a, a particular area of our collecting. Um, so. The responsibilities are, as you said, fiscal and sometimes also financial support, but it's really also giving the proper level of strategic guidance and um, 
sounding board supervision for sure, um, but really having an understanding of where they want to lead an institution of that size in a complex environment. And, and with that, of course, that's what the director and CEO does, but where board is being very helpful and uh, actually really uh, exercises a level of uh, scrutiny, guidance, um, and support that's ne necessary. Um, the influence on the almost like the programmatic side of the institution, meaning what do we show, how we show it, uh, what do we acquire, who do we invite to interpret our, our holdings, um, that is actually minimal uh, to, the, to the extent that we, we rely on the expertise, but there's a clear understanding that this is something that basically the museum, not only its director, but really uh, its outstanding curatorial workforce, uh, the experts that we have here on, on, on staff, and we have over 140 curators, that this is how, how this is, so to say, what, what the museum does. But um, certainly trustees are more involved in, in, in other parts of our, our institution, um, and they are, they are extremely connected to this institution in many ways. Um, and I think that's that's very helpful. We also have a really large acquisition committee where we discuss actually every acquisition on a certain scale that we want to do. And I certainly, of course, always share also the, the programmatic outlook and especially uh, the, the big, what we call the capital projects, which is where we are com completely reconfiguring certain parts of the museum, conceptually, curatorially, but also, of course, architecturally. And that requires also a significant financial resource. I want to unpack some of what you've been talking about here for the last few minutes. But before we do that, maybe we could zoom out from the Met itself here mm -hmm. a little bit. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and your philosophy right now on, you know, on the role of the museum broadly, not the Metropolitan Museum, but of museums. Um, obviously, we're living through an incredibly dynamic moment from profound political polit polarization, not just in our country. Uh, the rise of, of China and India and other countries that are sort of referred to as the global south, but also therefore greater prominence for the art that comes from those, uh, those parts of the world, uh, a reckoning with the cultural and colonial history of a lot of countries, um, you know, uh, to a reappraisal of what is the cultural canon uh, in, in a way. So it seems to me that modern cultural institutions are demanding, you know, more complicated skill sets. Um, it's no longer just about the art, so to speak, and and the function of a museum is is expanding from just no longer just collecting and preserving and presenting art, but you're now expected to engage with the uh, and be community facing, right, and be inclusive and uh, to engage in the debates of our time, so to speak, um, which has got to all be fraught. So talk a little bit about you know the the role and responsibility of the museum in modern society. Yeah. Well, I think you've described extremely well the complex landscape that we are operating in and where I would say we are also excited and proud to be at the center of it. Um, so one, uh, let me say, one big, big change for museums in the last couple of decades was we kind of migrated or, or morphed from being a docent, meaning an institution that tells you what you are looking at and how you should be looking at it uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation to a convener, an institution that basically brings together the society, brings together audiences into a discourse, into a discourse about art, but also in a, into a discourse about who we are, who we want to be, what our aspirations are, and how we come together as a community. And I would strongly argue that in our very polarized world, and you kind of described some aspects of it. Um, the museum is one of the few platforms where you can have a complex discussion, a complex cultural discourse, without immediately yelling at each other, uh, that you see so often in, in other media. Uh, so I think that the museum is a very positively connotated platform for society, for community to come together, to reflect on who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. And art is at the center of that. Um, which also, on the other hand, means that our visitors, 
more and more, and that, that is a generally positive development, see the museum as their museum, their institution. They expect the museum to represent their values, their understanding of things. Now that since we've diversified our audiences significantly, so you have many different community, communities participating in this institution. And that's kind of then the complex environment that you're operating in, that one's values might not be exactly the, the one of the other. And so you're bringing together that conversation in a really important way. I, I think what's important for institutions like the Met is that we define ourselves clearly as universal museums, ideally universally relevant encyclopedic institutions about the cultures of the world in one place. The challenge that we have in that context is clearly, and you have kind of given some hints to that, we are, we are operating in an environment right now, geopolitically, where you see nationalism on the rise in many different areas, many different countries. Where, where, where you sometimes see, uh, I would say, populist uh, politicians, populist governments using nationalism to fuel uh, their agenda. So the museum, like, a museum like the Met is almost like opposite to that agenda. We are not that interested in the nationalistic ideas of cultures. We actually want to show that cultures are, actually go sometimes across borders. The histories of cultures are across borders. And it basically is not a, a national idea that drives us. We, in that sense, are not the national institution also of the United States. We are a very global institution, bringing the cultures of the world to one place here, here in New York, but actually also disseminating our content to as many people around the world in a meaningful and, and inclusive way. Yeah, just uh, picking up on what you Somebody once wrote something along the lines of whoever controls the present can control the past. And if you can control the past, you can control the future. And that's certainly what we're seeing Vladimir Putin try to do. Um, and I want to come back to him in just a, um, uh, in, in just a moment. But, you know, you, 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 you referenced the, one of the, I think, unique elements of the Met and, and for our audience, if you really think about it, um, you know, the Met is, is a unique institution, not just because of its size, but because of this encyclopedic nature that Max just referred to, right? Um, you're, you're looking at cultures across the world and the spectrum from ancient art all the way up to art that's being made here in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the present day. Um, but, you know, uh, you, you have this then responsibility in how you display that as well. I mean, anybody who's sort of familiar with the geography of the Metropolitan Museum knows a big grand staircase inside the, uh, inside the lobby goes up to the European Painting Department, um, which is these beautiful rooms where, where the canon uh, of, of Western art sits. Um, you know, but one wonders, is that, is that a permanent fixture? When you see a world where it's not the, to, uh, to, to borrow a you know, business phrase, you know, pale, stale, and male at the top of the stairs, um, you know, it, it could, things, could things change? Um, I mean, it comes down to this question of who gets to tell the story. Um, of our collective history. Yeah. So, first of all, I would say it's not only one story, that there are actually multiple stories. Right. There, there is not this one story. There's not this one linear story of cultural development. There's also not that one story that you can tell. There are actually multiple intersecting stories. Some of them are even conflicting stories about cultural development and the, and the culture of the world. Um, I would say that... <clears throat> If you would build the Met right now, it would look very different than the Met that you, you see and visit. We are, of course, an institution, a legacy institution that has history embedded in it. The history of the last 150 years and how people, our donors, our, how, how, our staff of the Met looked at the world over these last 150 years. So there's no doubt that the Met is a more Western-centric institution than when, than if you would say, let's build an encyclopedic institution right now, uh, you would kind of create that differently from a, how our footprint is organized and maybe more also how our collections are being weighed. I mean, it's interesting that we have five different curatorial departments that deal one way or the other with European uh, art. We have one department that deals with the, the entire world of 
Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. Yeah? So all of that kind of shows you, yes, the museum is an organism that basically is changing, it's transforming, it's responding, it's slowly kind of ad adjusting. But I would say the history of this institution needs to still and continue to be readable for you to understand where, where we are coming from. One has to also see that the museum itself, the idea of the museum, is a Western idea. It's a Western European idea that came, came about. So in the next probably eight years, we are investing about a, a billion dollars in changing the museum's, uh, so to see, display of many important areas within our institutional uh, framework. And you will see a complete new reconfiguration of some of the galleries, some of the narratives, some of the stories that we're going to put forward. So in that sense, there is transformation, there is responsiveness, but there is also a strong tradition within this institution so that you understand even where it's coming from. But uh, to kind of go back to what you said at the very beginning, indeed, we are reacting and we are responding to the present. It allows us to give us new perspectives to the past and, and seeing them in the way that how we kind of reinterpret the past and who we let interpret the past will allow us to kind of propel forward towards the future as an institution that's more uh, inclusive and more of a community uh, that comes together, but is scholarly uh, as, as, as its very essence of what we are putting forward in regard to this narrative. So a few minutes ago, you brought up uh, geopolitics mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the propensity of these sort of nationalistic leaders, like, say, a Putin as an example, to wield art to their own yes. uh, narrative ends and the like. Uh, but I want to pivot the question here a little bit. I, I would note for our audience that you were on the International Advisory Board of the renowned um, State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, until the start of the war. Um, and I emphasize state because, um, as we said, the Putin regime here is uh, is attempting to effectively um, erase Ukrainian culture in many ways. Is the Hermitage or 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 those who lead these? And I understand war is a tough time to operate, but do they have a responsibility here? Are they complicit here? How do you see the role of uh, of leaders of arts institutions at a time as fraught as this? Well, I would say that first of all, I think it's a very complicated uh, position to be in as a as a Russian museum leader. And I want uh, and I have many friends in Russia. I have many friends among uh, the I would say the museum leaders within within the Russian uh, infrastructure. So I, I I totally understand the complexities that one is under, especially of course the the Russian. Uh, not only the Russian state, but of course the Russian cultural infrastructure is totally state dependent. Uh, so you, you have to be aware of that. Indeed, I've been, or I was, uh, on uh, the International Advisory Board of the of the Hermitage Museum for, I think, over 10 years. Uh, so, I, and it's it's an important board, actually. Uh, so I, I, I know this institution very well. I know, the, uh, I know the leadership very well. I know the development extremely well. Um, I'm a strong believer that the culture, culture and cultural institutions build bridges and uh, almost like sustain communication and exchange when even the political channels are, are clogged or are, are no longer communicating. So we, we, are, we, we, for example, we just opened a major show in Shanghai in China. Um, and the, at the moment when, when the the, so to see the tariff wars started under Trump uh, between China and the US, the Met made it a point to kind of, and I, I traveled to China to meet with our colleagues and also with the cultural ministry in Beijing and other things. Uh, the Met had, had, has had this long relationship with China. We are continuing to having these so the exchanges, communication, et cetera. I see that as a role, as an important role of museums and especially of a museum like, like the Met. Um, so for me, that's always the last bridge that should be kind of kept, or the last bond that should should, should go uh, go apart. In regard to Russia, it was an important, still still kind of it was important, and of course for me, uh, at some point I, I clearly decided I have to step off that board because given the sanctions and also the environment that we are in, I couldn't be 
part of a representational right. institution within that context. Um, but I, I would argue probably that um, whenever uh, we are out in, in a different environment again, it will be probably the, the Russian cultural museums or institutions that will be the first ones where, we, where dialogue will, will happen again. And they will probably, um, yes, they, they follow a certain agenda at some point. Uh, but on the other hand, I think we all see uh, that the, the world of art, the world of culture is also the world, world where we meet, where we stay in dialogue and where we will continue to have these exchanges. You know, on that on that point, the importance of this cultural exchange and that dialogue. One of the other sort of phenomenon of the last, you know, few, last few decades um, has been the the lending of or the selling of uh, or the the naming rights to institutions being built um, in in other parts of the world using brand name museums, right? Um, and I'm sure that brings in a a, a lot of money. Um, there's branding elements uh, to it. Uh, but the, along with that also comes the accusation of so-called art washing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you feel about that, that appropriation of, uh, of everything that, that, a, that, that an institution represents, um, but being used in, in, in markets where perhaps that kind of um, freedom of expression that we, that we treasure so much uh, in our institutions here and in Europe say, you know, um, where they don't agree with that necessarily. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that the, um, and I've been involved in this actually from, from the beginning of my career uh, when I was at the Guggenheim Museum as uh, assistant director and then chief of staff. Uh, and the Guggenheim pursued a, a very strong, so to see, satellite concept of kind of developing Guggenheim Museums in, in other parts of the, of the world. Um, the impetus of uh, other countries to to bring that in, be that a, a Louvre, Abu Dhabi, or a Guggenheim Bilbao, is on the one hand touristic, um, and by bringing in a certain brand name, immediately jump starting a certain level of cultural tourism, bringing in expertise for sure, because that's sometimes missing, and you, you yes you get that, but you're right, it's also a way of kind of changing the narrative sometimes about a certain region, certain country, um, and um, you. One has to be very careful about uh, so to see what what one is being used for, but actually also what that means for you as an institution um, in regard to the framework that you enter, but also what you're seeing uh, uh, by being so involved in this particular area of the world. So at, as at the Met and as a Met director, um, we made a very conscious decision. We are not opening any other Met museums around the world. It would kind of completely pivot or, or kind of uh, put a different kind of almost like balance to our really multi centric involvement around the world in different cultures that we all represent uh, within the museum, uh, given that we more often than not have the best uh, collection of art outside of these source countries. So the Met's role is really to be engaged and involved in as many different areas of the world or cultures of the world. Uh, not moving in and out, but really meaningful engagement with the, also the local uh, communities, with the local scholarship, with basically having that dialogue, rather than lending the Mets brand and imprimatur for, uh, so to say, a more representational uh, factor. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's an important piece uh, for us to, to do it that way. You, you could argue, yes, we are, we are missing out on a certain financial opportunity here. But again, I think that we have the philanthropic support of our board and of, of our many donors that allow us to kind of play that different role and not mine that opportunity just for financial uh, support. You know, one of the things that really drives a lot of museum attendance is, is, is clearly blockbuster shows and blockbuster shows that bring art from around the world into one place for a particular, particularly special show. And I'm wondering if, and you know, just thinking um, of this summer uh, or spring alone, um, many people got on planes and flew to Amsterdam to see the Vermeer show uh, at the Rijksmuseum. It's, there's a lot, uh, I've read on that that uh, that will never happen again. Uh, the greatest collection of the existing Vermeers in one place probably will never happen again. The Mona Lisa itself 
uh, back in 1963, came to the Met and came to Washington, D.C. Um, obviously, for people of my age, the, the, the Tutankhamen uh, tour in the 1970s was one of the like, you know, seminal moments in our, in our cultural lives. But is it becoming harder because of the age of the, uh, the art and becoming more delicate to um, trade issues between countries, the nationalistic politics and control of the narrative that these pieces of art represent? Is it, is it going to be harder to do this going forward? Or do you think politics of all this has always been, been complex and, and major museums such as yourself and the Louvre and, and the like will, will be able to continue this kind of art exchange, exchange going forward? Yeah. I would say that we, we do our best to stay out of politics uh, in, in that context and really make these exhibitions and that the loan exchange that happens with it a matter of collegial support between institutions based on an understanding of what an exhibition does uh, for that particular institution, for the scholarship that's, uh, that's represented there, and also the work that went into thinking through that uh, particular show. Um, there is no doubt that there are certain uh, exhibitions that uh, will attract an, a significant audience. And basically, the, the Rijks Museum did, uh, worked on this premiere show for about 10 years. We all knew that they, they are working on it. The Met has a bigger collection of Vermeers than the Rijks Museum had. Uh, and so we, we knew that they would be coming to us for support and for, for lending our, our works. Um, and some of these exhibitions are certainly a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to see them. Um, so for us, should we have done the Vermeer show? Uh, well, we could have done it given our cloud uh, and uh, the importance of our collection. But we really felt if a Vermeer show of that kind, it should happen in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum. Uh, there is a certain, so to say, of course, locality that's involved with it uh, that basically makes that uh, right. Um, so in a certain sense, I feel the excitement of, about exhibitions like that uh, and some of the almost like the tourism that's involved with it is, the, is a generally positive thing. It basically means an excitement about art, an excitement about an artistic development. It's the outcome also of a lot of the work that we are doing by basically educating an audience, uh, trying to kind of make people understand what what, what art is, what, what Vermeer did, and, and, and all of that. So I, I think that there is a, there's a generally like joint um, work that's behind that of many museums. These shows will get more and more difficult. Um, not so much because of politics, but because there are more and more museums who want and can do exhibitions on that size and who are basically having sometimes the same ideas, or at least the want to do the uh, similar things around the similar, similar artistic oeuvre. So what has been possible in the 1970s is no longer possible now just because you have much more, many more exhibitions who can and want to do shows on the scale of what, what you just mentioned, Tutankhamun or, or, or anything on that context. And it's uh, to a certain extent up to the really large scale institutions basically, again, also make sure that we are as supportive and as generous to, to the field. But uh, I can tell you the Met is probably the biggest lender of artworks in the United States uh, um, and the recipient of the, the, the most loan requests. It is getting harder and harder to fulfill all of these requests, and we, we just can't do it anymore. I want to ask you about restitution, which has become a very big issue, obviously. And I think for myself, when I think of restitution, I think of two major areas. Um, the first is, um, uh, is, is, not, is art that was confiscated or stolen uh, or sold under duress during the Nazi uh, era. Um, and so I guess my question on that front is that, is that starting to come to an end? Like, has all of that been sort of discovered and done, or do you think there's still a large, uh, a large portion that, uh, that, that needs to be sorted out? But the second, of course, is, um, you know, is, 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 is antiquities uh, that were sort of illegally taken out of, um, out of countries or, their, or the provenance is not, um, uh, is not documented or, or, or the like. And in fact, uh, on that front, the New York Times ran an article recently back in June, I think. They said the Met has been so pummeled by seizures that Max Holine unveiled a plan last month for the museum to essentially investigate itself. 
hiring a research team to explore the provenance of its um, uh, of, of its works. Um, but again, going back to what you said at the very, very beginning, a lot of other institutions around the world who are in the same situation are looking to the Met for leadership on on how to how to deal with this. Yeah. So first of all, uh, Nazi looted art. Uh, this is probably the area of restitution that not only the the public knows I know a lot about and that uh, museums have embraced. Uh, Certainly, first and foremost, within Germany uh, and then in Europe and also in the United States. We have a fairly developed understanding of, of it, a kind of so to say, criteria that have been developed and uh, what's the, uh, a sensitivity and an awareness within the institutions. It's not going to be, we are not, when you ask, so are we done with this? We, we are not done with it uh, because it will continue to evolve because we will still see evidence that we have not seen before or we will look at a certain case in a different way so i i still expect uh restitutions in that area area uh but uh you yes we, this is a field that has been to so see worked on and been diligently kind of scrutinized for quite some time um and we are very experienced in doing it um the other category that you tried to frame is indeed. Can I, can I just interrupt for one moment yeah. on, before we move on to that? You know, w one thing that the Nazis did, they may have stolen a lot of the art and the and looted art and whatnot, but it was preserved or a lot of it was preserved. In other instances, whether it's um, in, you know, um, Taliban controlled Afghanistan or in, during the Iraq war, perhaps now in Ukraine as well, we're seeing outright destruction of art. Um, is that what you're hearing about a lot in Ukraine right now, or is it, it, it how concerned are you on that? Yes, the, the destruction of uh, of also the cultural patrimony as a as an act of war, um, as an act of extinguishing also your your own cultural identity, uh, sometimes your national identity, is something that we have seen in the history of of the world since the since ancient times. Uh, and it is a means of warfare, and it's there's uh, UNESCO conventions that are big against it. We, we, uh, countries agreed not to do it, but it is something that we are very aware of and uh, and are monitoring uh, closely. And the Met certainly plays and has played uh, an, an important role in uh, sort of the cultural rescue missions. And then also in going into countries or war torn countries afterwards to kind of make sure uh, that basically, uh, especially in the aftermath of, of a conflict, that basically there is not a depletion of the, the cultural identity of that country. But we are, we are always concerned and are trying to uh, provide as many tools as possible during a war uh, for the countries to, to, to preserve their own cultural uh, heritage. In that context. So you're very right in pointing it out, and I can see, I can't talk about everything that we do, uh, but uh, you can uh, trust us that we are deeply involved in that, same as some other institutions, especially those in Washington. We are, we are partnering there very closely, and also with UNESCO. Um, so if you go to the second uh, part, uh, which like area of this is, which, which basically is stolen art, and it kind of obviously stolen is a very kind of vague term, but let's see, um, What's more important is almost like illegally uh, removed artwork, either either illegally removed from its place of origin or also illegally exported out of a uh, out of a country. Um, you you are operating within a framework where you can uh, first legally define uh, based on a certain set of rules and laws and uh, who is actually the rightful owner. And you will find out then uh, as a museum that sometimes you you are not. Uh, because based on certain flaws in the provenance that you have, or you find out that a certain object actually that you thought was legally exported, it was in fact actually illegally exported. What you see right now is a level of scrutiny and also a level of documentation coming forward that basically necessitates us to revisit a number of our acquisitions and also to act and react to uh, evidence coming forward. Um, I would say that it's really also the, in this case, um, to the merit uh, 
of the, the district attorney's office here in New York City, um, who basically built a task for us, like none other in the world, to really pursue the questions of um, illegally um, illegally uh, exported uh, works. And also they, what they did was they seized also a number of dealer archives. Uh, and with that, suddenly documentation comes forward that we never had access to. It necessitates us not only to react, but also it was a moment for us to say, well, we we need to and we can now uh, significantly enhance and uh, and expand our efforts in uh, in so to say provenance research uh, at the museum. We've been doing this for decades, but now is a moment to kind of further expand on that. Uh, we are doing that. The the third area, though, that I you have not mentioned that I think is the most complicated one, is the question of ethical uh, returns. So the, when we operate within a legal framework, it's very clear, okay, if something else is illegally exported, you're no longer, you're not the owner of it, uh, even if you just received an object that, I mean, sometimes you're not the, the one who illegally, who was part of the illegal export, of course. You, you get something donated after many, many years later, and it changed hands maybe three times in between. Um, but the moment you are more in this ethical framework, where basically, uh, do you return an object because it was uh, taken from a country in a, during a war in the 19th century, and uh, back then there were no laws, or even that was followed by a law, but you find uh, there's an ethical, almost like a responsibility to do it that you really have to do case by case and very individually because it's a very complex environment and it basically there are no clear rules and regulations that come with it. Is there a challenge though in terms of, it's one thing to determine um, that uh, perhaps your institution is not the rightful owner of something for either the purpose, yes. either, for any of the reasons that you just spoke about. And in some cases, it might be an easy discussion, a state-to-state -state discussion, say, between the United Kingdom and Greece over the Elgin marbles, as an example. But in many cases, and here I'm thinking, obviously, of like the Benin bronzes in Nigeria, where it's not necessarily, maybe you're not the rightful owner, but it's not entirely clear who is the rightful owner. So what do you do in that instance? I think both examples that you have actually bring us in, in the area of ethical questions. So, I mean, the, uh, the, the so-called the, the Parthenon marbles or Elgin marbles, although the Greeks would never call them Elgin yeah. marbles, uh, uh, they, I mean, from a legal standpoint, they were legally exported. That's at least what the British would certainly argue. Um, but uh, the, the Greek government have, has been for decades uh, kind of appealing to almost like an ethical uh, to right. see responsibility to, to return them. Um, so in this case, you would have a clear, uh, like, place of where they would go back to. In regard to the Benin bronzes, there's another kind of whole layer of conversation right now about a, um, of course, you have the, the punitive action of the British, uh, uh, so to say, um, colonial power in, 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 the, in Benin uh, that kind of then moved uh, or ta has taken the, these, uh, the Benin bronzes out of the country. Uh, but now that there are questions about like, if uh, if countries are deciding to return it, who do they want to return it to? Who can they return it to? And in what context is that kind of then also uh, happening? It's a it's a complex environment in in that uh, particular case. And sometimes, so to say, uh, we we need to make sure though we we follow uh, our own uh, not only ethical compass, but that we are also really in dialogue with these countries. So the Met. Uh, we've returned uh, three Benin bronzes, actually, in, in this context. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, it's clearly, I mean, the U.S. Is not, has not been a colonial power also in, in this. Uh, so the, 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 uh, I would say the, uh, the countries that are in this dialogue right now are first and foremost, of course, in this case, European countries, Germany and Great Britain, first and foremost. Right. right. So I'm conscious of the time, so I want to ask you to do the impossible here. I want to ask you about three difficulties. Okay. Difficult artists, um, a difficult art, and difficult donors. How you sort of deal with them, right? In a sense, and, and when I'm talking about difficult art, I'm talking about something like Philip Gust, uh, Gustin. For those unfamiliar, you know, regardless of the artist's intent and 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 what the commentary he was trying to make, 
um, the sort of almost cartoonish clan imagery could be triggering to some, of course. Um, difficult artists. Um, obviously, Picasso was under reappraisal for his, uh, you know, for, for misogyny and other things. And in fact, the Brooklyn Museum this year um, uh, dedicated an ex exhibit to that. But even Carl Lagerfeld, who's on display at the, uh, at the Met right now at the Costume Institute, has had, you know, has had some troubling issues around him. I mean, of course, d difficult donors, people who put their names on wings and buildings and whatnot, and who later become uh, sort of anathema, culturally anathema. How do you how do you deal with these kinds of these types of challenges? Okay, so at the end of the conversation, you're throwing a lot of <laughs> complex issues at me. So I, I, I had to go around. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to get a response to that uh, as as succinctly as as possible. So first, about the question of uh, art that can be kind of I would say misunderstood, misinterpreted, or it could be triggering for some. And Philip, you mentioned uh, the example of Philip Guston, and uh, Met uh, has been uh, an institution that has collected Philip Guston for ever since, and we've just received a major, major gift uh, from the Philip Guston, uh, I mean, from, from Musa Meyer, the Philip Guston's daughter, and we will become the biggest and most important repository of Philip Guston's work. We strongly believe in Philip Guston's work and we want to celebrate and contextualize that. I think we have a responsibility as museums to basically really uh, provide the proper context and understanding for art that can be sometimes misinterpreted, can be misunderstood, and is complex by its sheer definition. That's what art is also all about. That's what so to see, Gus also wanted to kind of articulate in his art in that context. So I think that uh, the tendency to then try to simplify or to kind of boil it down so that basically there are no there are no misunderstandings. I think that would be the wrong, wrong path to take. We want to make sure that you can understand art in its all its complexities, in its misunderstandings. In its, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes use this example is uh, to, for example, Bruce Springsteen's song, Born in the USA, is actually an, a complex song. It's an anti-war song. It's yeah. being sung as a national anthem sometimes in stadiums, in a, uh, in a kind of a sort of so misunderstanding of what what this actually the song is actually about. So in a certain way, we have we have an educational role to make like your perception and your understanding of the world and and, and what artists also want to see. We we need to make sure that you understand the complexities of it, and uh, and it will give you a richer experience in that sense. Um, about the questions of, so to say, you, you framed it in a, with the phrase complicated artists. Um, I would strongly argue that the idea that uh, we can, we should only look at art or we can only appreciate art that is being done by a, so to say, morally impeccable uh, author, I, I think that that's, uh, that's absurd or it doesn't lead us anywhere. Uh, is it appropriate to, um, show the uh, the complexity or, or sometimes even also the failings of an artist's life that's that's totally appropriate especially when i would see our understanding of an artist is so much can be linked to an artist figure or even like a misunderstanding of the personality but um i am i'm a total uh, believer in the to the city uh, that we, we we need to look at art uh, um, and have a certain understanding of the authorship, but there is no way that you uh, that you want to kind of link the uh, the the ability to appreciate a certain artwork only uh, with the with the idea that you can only look at it if if the author has a has a so to say an impeccable uh, CV that you can put in front of uh, uh, front of front of you. Um, in regards to the donor question that you have, is I I would. I would say first and foremost, the Met is a very good institution to support. It is a generally positive institution. It is an institution for the public good, beloved by many and therefore as many people as possible. So I would generally say um, we, we want to make sure that we get the support from the broadest spectrum of, of, of people and from the, from the widest political spectrum or uh, what, what, what have you. Um, we want to make sure, though, that whatever, whenever we so to see, so to see, celebrate also the philanthropy that comes with it, we need to make sure that it kind of is 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 tied to our ethical values and to the values that the institution uh, stands for, uh, and that sometimes leads you to decisions, sometimes together with the donor, 
to say, well, uh, actually, uh, this is not a time to, uh, to uh, uh, this is not appropriate or no longer appropriate, or, or we've seen facts that basically uh, should prevent us and should not lead us to kind of, to, to so to say, celebrate uh, the level of uh, philanthropy in that from that particular source that we have received. Yeah, I, um, I I hear you. I, my my family and I became members of the uh, of the Metropolitan Museum because of our love for that institution and what it represents and how important it is. But I would be lying if I told you that it wasn't also a little bit so that I don't have to stand in line uh, to uh, to get in. Um, I want to I want to close here um, and 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 ask you. You know, it's summertime in New York. Uh, people are coming from around the world and uh, around the country. Uh, obviously, uh, there's some blockbuster shows going on right now. The, the Lagerfeld that we mentioned that was the uh, that was introduced at the uh, this year's uh, Met Gala. Uh, oh, the Rock Show, the Cypress Show, yeah, the Go Show, uh, absolutely. The one I'm very interested to see uh, as soon as I can get there again is the Cecily Brown Show. Right. Um, but as we look out after you know uh, after the summer and into later this year, next year, what are the what are the big Things that people ought to be looking forward to uh, at the at the Met this year. Well, I don't want to turn this into a final promotional reel, but uh, <laughs> I can tell you right after this interview, I'm gonna go back uh, in, uh, and see the installation, which is currently in progress of a really stunning exhibition, uh, which is also a lot about what we just talked about in the last hour on early Buddhist sculpture from southern India. Uh, and it has been a really complex show to put together. We worked on it for the last five years. It obviously kind of had to do, the complexities then had to do with COVID, but also a lot of this material comes from temple sites, from, from our, uh, and it basically is, is the outcome of a long, long relationship that we have with India and with the, with the cultures of India, but also with cultural institutions there. As you can imagine, also over the last five years, Indian government changed, Indian politics changed. Uh, the relationship between the US and India has Changed, or it's kind of right now in a, in a complex environment. So it's a really important exhibition uh, for culturally. It really brings together uh, cultural uh, artifacts as you have never seen before. But it certainly is also a signal. It's a signal of cultural dialogue in a in a major way. So uh, we are opening this in the in the middle of the summer, but it will run uh, during the fall. And so I absolutely say you need to see this. This is an outstanding exhibition. Uh, and then we are sh uh, opening a show on uh, money and Dega uh, right after the summer. And it's a show that we, where we collaborated uh, with the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And there are two institutions that have really outstanding holdings of money and Dega, certainly the Musée d'Orsay, but also the, the Met. And so we partnered, and this is, goes to your questions about how do you do these complex loan shows. So these two institutions partnered in making sure that we have already the, the greatest corpus of works by Manet and Degas, these two artists who kind of almost like mirrored each other, sometimes worked uh, against each other, for, with each other, uh, and then brought together all the important loans that make this a, an absolutely astounding show on Manet and Degas. It's currently breaking all the attendance records in Paris and will soon be here in New York. Well, that's fantastic. And that's a great, uh, a great note to end on. Uh, Max Hollein, I uh, unfortunately I had a bunch of other things that I wanted to talk to you about, such as the breadth of what you're dealing with over there. But um, I just want to say thank you very much for being uh, with me today as a New Yorker. Thank you for, um, you know, your stewardship of this institution that we're all so proud of. Um, and um, look forward to having a conversation with you again. And thank you very much for being our 100th guest. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you all for joining. Till next time, I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York. Have a great day.